So Jeff came and asked me who wanted to talk first. It was out of us and Leon. And I said, well, usually the, the guys in the green jeans and green pants are the most unpopular in a room full of hunters anyway. So we'll go ahead and get them out of the way. Uh, for most of y'all, I see a lot of familiar faces in, in here. A lot of y'all know me. For, the, for those of y'all who don't, I'm, I'm Garrett Kimball. I've been a game warden for 17 years. Um, I've worked several different regions of the state. I started out in the Lake Charles area, um, transferred several years later to the Felicianas, worked those for several years, finally transferring back home here uh, to my home. There's a reason why I settled back home. I love this community. Um, we had Hunter Ed class started yesterday, finished up today. We had uh, 50 students certified. Most of those were, uh, were youth. Um, we did have a few adults come in and take the class as well. Uh, it was a great course. We had a lot of working parts for that. We had some volunteer instructors. Brad Jackson was our main instructor. Um, I helped teach a little bit, but we had uh, Daryl Turtle Arsenault cooked a, a mean chicken and sausage spaghetti. Did a really good job for the lunch. Our Wildlife Agents Association, Association donated the, the ingredients and the meat and stuff like that for, for that meal. Um, but we were able to certify 50 people, and, um, you know, that's something that the community needs. You know, back when I was a kid, we took hunters ed in, in, in school. Uh, I think it was around 6th, 7th grade, something like that, in middle school. Uh, we no longer do that anymore. So there is an online version of the class that's now available in connection with a, with a field day. But so that kind of, that and the in-person classes has kind of taken the place of those certifications that we used to do years ago in the field. But we try to keep those readily available. It was really good to see uh, that, that large group. I think typically we have 20 or 30 people certified in the smaller classes. So it was good to see a big group and it was good to see that take place right here in our community. Um, I'm gonna let Brad kind of talk a little bit about uh, the Hunter Ed uh, in a little bit, but um, you know, we've had some pretty severe hunting incidents over the years, and so Bradley and I were kind of talking about, you know, what we were going to discuss with y'all, and so that was one of the main things that we kind of agreed on that we needed to mention. So we kind of want to highlight some of the, you know, like the profile of a typical hunting accident in Louisiana. Um, the number one cause of a hunting accident in Louisiana is usually related to a tree stand fall from, a, from an elevated position. Um, you know, there are several different, different things that, that we can do to combat that. There's a fall arrest system such as these harnesses that you can, uh, that you can wear. This one's actually one that I bought that I hunt with. It's, you know, got some pockets and stuff for your gear and whatnot. But, but basically, you wear that as a full harness in connection with a lifeline, which I actually secured one of those over here to this basketball goal, but the tables kind of interfered a little bit. But I'll show you all what I'm talking about. Um, in connection with a lifeline that's secured to the tree, you know, this, of course, would be up above where your stand is, and then it's secured at the bottom. So when you have your fall arrest system on, your, your, your hunter safety system or, or whatever brand vest on, you can connect into here and then what's, what's called a, a Prusik knot. And basically, as you climb, you maintain the three points of contact, you reach, you slide the knot up, reach back on your ladder, climb up, and continue to slide up as you go. That keeps you connected from the ground up at all times. If you happen to you know, lose your footing or lose your balance or whatever and fall, that's gonna catch you. So we strongly encourage that. That's, that's, that's our most, usually whenever a, a fall occurs from 15, 20 feet, you're talking about some, some very serious injuries and a lot of times death. So that's what we always recommend. That's probably our number one, uh, it is our number one hunt, hunting incident, um, reportable hunting incident in Louisiana. The second is, is a catch-all phrase, I guess, to cover the second would be just unsafe gun handling. Um, you know, not keeping the muzzle pointed in a safe direction at all times, not treating that firearm, uh, any, fire, any and all firearm as if it's loaded. Um, and probably the third would be, um, you know, failure to properly identify your target, um, slash mistaken for game is what they call it. So, you know, shooting at, shooting at movement in the bushes when you don't know exactly what that target is that you're shooting at, that kind of stuff. So we just kind of wanted to highlight those. Um, in addition to my patrol duties here, I also do hunting accident investigations. So 
in a field, those are the ones that we most commonly see. The reports that we compile goes to Bradley. He enters them into the International Hunter Education Association database. And then throughout the nation, those stats are kept on how many hunting incidents we have throughout the nation. So um, we kind of both work a lot with the hunting accident reports. But um, I'm going to let him talk a little bit about the hunter ed and stuff and anything I didn't cover. Thank you. So thank you all for having us. As Garrett said, my name is Brad Jackson. I'm a biologist supervisor in the education section. So now uh, I've had a couple of people harass me since I've been here, you know, saying <laughs> game warden, game warden. Well, that's just Garrett. I'm one of the nice guys. <laughs> uh, I've been doing this for about 10 years now. Uh, so as you can imagine, I've taught quite a many kids. Uh, we heavily rely on our volunteer instructors, and some of the folks that were here this weekend saw that and how much we really appreciate the efforts they, they put into our program. And quite honestly, we couldn't do it without them. Uh, so this is just one of, of the few classes. I'm typically more focused on training volunteer instructors to get out into their communities. Uh, but it's definitely a great opportunity every now and then to teach a student course, especially with Garrett and uh, being able to come out. Uh, so yeah, definitely uh, tree stand incidents are at the top of the list. Last year we had seven incidents total across the state. Out of those seven, five were tree stand related. So it's, it's something that uh, people just don't take as seriously. Uh, obviously since hunter education was mandated uh, or create or made mandatory in 1984, we have had a large drop in firearm incidents, which is great. But as I said, those tree stand incidents have climbed and that's typically what makes up the majority of our hunting incidents every year. Now, luckily, I mean, they may not be fatal all the time. They, we certainly have had some fatalities, but more hunters are, are injured with tree stands because they just, they don't wear their harness. Uh, and the main thing, whether you're using a lifeline, which is great, that's kind of more geared towards if you have a a fixed position stand, so whether it's a ladder stand or a hang-on, lock-on, whatever you want to call it, that's kind of what those lifelines are geared towards. But no matter what type of tree stand you're using, if you're using a climber or one of those others, there are, there are ways to be connected to that, to that tree from the moment your feet leave the ground till you return. Hold on, bring that. Bring that uh. <clears throat> and a harness like this, if you buy a TMA approved or tree stand manufacturer association tree stand, approved tree stand, it's going to come with a harness, a TMA approved harness, which is probably like that. Uh, so now obviously it looks kind of like <laughs> a bundle of ratchet straps or something like you might have in the bed of your truck. But for about $125-ish, $150, you can buy kind of an upgraded version that's more user friendly. But people overlook that. I think everyone in here would agree that their life is worth $150, right? Uh, but one thing to mention, do you still use it? Still. Oh, okay. I was going to say, <laughs> I say, normally there's an orange uh, tag on this tether. <laughs> and uh, it's recommended that you replace your harness. Yeah, it looked kind of old. Uh, five years beyond the manufacture date that is on your tether tag. So, of course, you can see, thank goodness you're not using this one. But, <laughs> uh, or, or, of course, if you have worn it in a fall. Uh, but, I mean, that's cheap, cheap insurance. Uh, a lot of hunters don't bat an eye at spending several thousand dollars on firearms, optics, archery equipment, but they shortchange themselves on something that can certainly save their lives. So going back to Hunter Ed, the Hunter Ed course, this course that we taught this weekend was a standard classroom course like many of us in here probably took when we were a youngster. Uh, there are three different ways to get Hunter Ed certified. So one is a 10 hour minimum of two day classroom course like we held here. Uh, for 10 to 15 year old students, they have to be at least 10 years old by the last day of the course to get certified. Uh, they can utilize the online course with a field day, so for 10 to 15. If we have an individual that is 16 or older, they can take the Hunter Education course strictly online, and we do have two, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have two approved courses that we accept. 
if you take the, the Louisiana base course, you'll probably see actually me and Garrett and some of the videos on it because we did shoot some videos for it. Uh, but yeah, 10 years old is, is the magic number for certification. Once you have it done, you'll never have to take Hunter Ed again. So did you want to talk about licensing stuff? So we're going to mention some of the some of the changes in, re, in the regulations for the 22-23 hunting season. Um, there's really no major changes. For those of y'all who picked up the regulations books on your way in, you can look on page four, and all of those are listed. Anytime there's a new regulations pamphlet, the the changes for that year from what it was the previous year is going to be listed on that on that front page. Um, basically, there was a license restructure. Most of y'all know that. A lot of the license increased. However, there were a lot of licenses that were eliminated, and they were kind of captured by some different licenses. Um, we, have, we now have a youth hunting license. Everybody 16 and younger, I'm sorry, 17 and younger are going to be required to have that, the youth hunting license. Um, the senior hunting fish license went up, the age went up to age 65. Um, so, you can't get the senior hunting fish until you turn 65 years of age or older. Um, there were some WMA changes. We used to have a wildlife management area hunting permit. Now we have what's called a wildlife management area access permit. So any activity um, that, you're, that you're doing on wildlife man management area land, you're required to have that WMA access permit. Basically, you need to, yeah, you any, any state administered land, that's right, it's not just wildlife management that's areas. 18 yeah, 18 and older is the age on that, so youth are not required to have that. Um, whereas only hunters used to use, have the WMA hunting permit. Because we have a lot of hikers and we have a lot of people who use those lands and it, it costs a lot of money to keep the trails up and stuff like that. And the, yeah, for people going to the shooting ranges and stuff like that. So. Um, I mean, we, you can really look at these. If, if y'all have questions about these, just we'll, we'll be here to the end of this so y'all can get with us. But we're not going to take up a whole lot of time for Mr. Leon. I know he's got a good story. He's got a good story about these uh, safety harnesses that he wants to tell. Actually, I, I think he's got a couple of them. But um, I want to thank y'all for coming out. It really is great to see such a, a, a big group of hunters. And uh, we want to wish y'all a successful hunting season, but we want to wish y'all a safe hunting season. We want to make sure that y'all return uh, home safely to your families after each hunt. So, um, like I said, we'll be here to the end. If y'all got any questions for us, just, just come see us. Yeah. All right, thank y'all, guys. Um, I, I just want to take a moment and kind of acknowledge how we ended up here tonight. Um, I had attended an event similar to this years ago, one at Emmanuel Baptist in Hammond. Some of you may remember when they had one there uh, and that's probably 20 years ago and, and then about maybe 10 years ago I attended one or two years of a similar event at uh, Woodland Baptist uh, down in the below Springfield area and so from those experiences I, I was thinking man this would be a, a really really good thing for the for the Albany community no one out here had this going on that I could think of and Garrett had come to me uh, maybe a year or so back with an idea for hosting a hunter safety class here on our campus because we had so many of our own kids, including my, my two children and Garrett's two children, that needed to take hunter safety. And so well, we started brainstorming, and, and he called me back, I'm going to say sometime in June, and he's like, I got some dates for us. And he, he threw me out a couple of dates, and one of the dates was this weekend. And I said, I think that that's going to work out just right, but let's do more than just the hunter safety. Let's, let's turn it into a bigger event, a bigger weekend. And so that's what uh, led to this event. And so I just wanted to uh, thank Garrett for uh, not only the work that he does as a game warden, but also for helping to, uh, to bring this to our community and to our church. So thank you. <clears throat> And while I'm thanking people, there's two more people that I just wanted to, to draw mention to. Uh, behind every good man is a good woman. And so uh, next to Garrett is his lovely wife, Miss Lindsay. She has worked tirelessly this last week or extended period. I just wanted to say thank you, Lindsay. 
And standing in the back, I know she's not going to be happy with me for this. She's shaking her head, but my wife, Ashley, thank you. So, <clears throat> All right, Caitlin, come on back. I need you again. We've got to give some more stuff away. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Bronson, I need you again. <clears throat> All right, this next item that we're going to give away is uh, Leon Stilley's most famous piece of hunting equipment. It's a Q-beam. Oh, wait, that was a, that, we don't have one of those. Sorry, Garrett. <laughs> All right, so, uh, and sorry, Leon. Yeah. All right, the next item that we're going to give away is uh, a lethal field spray and attractants package from Southern Boys Outdoors. This nice item here. And the winner is? Elaine Watts. Ooh, yeah, my mama. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. So we'll bring it to you, Mom. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, all the way on the end down there, Bronson. Yeah. Next, we have a $25 gift card to Academy. And the winner is? Reno. No last name. Okay. All right. There we go, sir. <clears throat> Grab you one of those Academy cards right there. Our next item is another hat from Southern Boys Outdoors. It goes to? I'm going to get it open. Penny Brunies. All right, Miss Penny. Let her pick out one of the Southern Boys hats there, please. Then we have an outdoor cooking utensil set, black bucket, from Circle A Hardware. And the winner is? Mike Greco. Mike Greco. All right, Mike. We have a horn hunter pack from Archery and Fishing Unlimited. I think it's that kind of fanny pack hanging on the side there. And it goes to? Patrick Alstero. Patrick Alston. <laughs> One size fits most. <laughs> All right. So, our next item is a shotgun camo wrap from Southern Boys Outdoors. Blake Brown. All right, Blake. There you go, sir. We have another $25 gift card to Academy that goes to? Kaylin Addison. Daddy is putting it in his pocket as we speak. So, all right. I'll get this from you later. Good luck. Yeah. Our next item to give away is 25 pounds of smoked sausage to the Hess Express. And the winner is? Kippy Cooper. All right, Kippy. Where are you at? There we go. Good deal. Our next item is a tripod bag chair from Archery and Fishing Unlimited. Jessica Aranosi. All right. We have a jambalaya and seasoning kit from Southern Boys Outdoors. A wrap. That goes to? David Brunies. All right, Mr. David. A couple more before I turn it over to Mr. Leon Stilley. We have another hat to Southern Boys Outdoors. It goes to? Haley Bordialon. Haley Bordelon. We're going to work on our uh, reading skills here. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Next, we have one dozen burritos from the Hess Express. Blake Aranosi. <laughs> All right, one more item before we pass it on. We have another $25 gift card to Academy that goes to Brent Banksnam. All right. All right, at this time, I'm going to ask Mr. Leon Stilley to come and join us. Uh, let me introduce him by just telling you a little bit about this man. He is a 13-time Louisiana state champion turkey caller, and he is the 2021 Louisiana Sportsman of the Year, Mr. Leon Stilley. Apparently, they didn't do a lot of research on that Sportsman of the Year. I mean, a, a Stilly from Livingston Parish is the Louisiana Sportsman of the Year. That's, but I'm, that's a, that was a great honor for me. I, I, uh, I actually thought they were, I thought it was some of my buddies playing a joke on me, but it turned out to be a, uh, what it is, the uh, Outdoorsman Hall of Fame, Louisiana chapter. Uh, someone nominated me to be sportsman of the year and you know it's just uh what how i got there was was just you know having been a lifetime of of taking a lot of people hunting and especially kids handicapped people and uh and elderly folks so i've always taken a lot of people hunting and uh uh with southern boys kenyon and tanya and them i, I do a lot of volunteer work you know during a, in the community so all that came together and they, they chose me to be the Louisiana Sportsman of the Year and uh, I'm, I'm really proud of it but uh, Jeff and them asked me to come up here and do some uh, some turkey call uh, a turkey call presentation and as I was taking all my calls out of my bag I, it, it dawned on me that I actually have an evolution of turkey calls here you know I got turkey calls from way back and, and I was like I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do an evolution of turkey calls. But before I get into the turkey calling, I want to touch on uh, Brother Garrett and Brad's uh, lifeline there. That, li that lifeline right there saved my life in 2015. Thank God I got a wife that loves me and cares about me. She bought me one because I had a, a previous accident or two and... Uh, she bought me one, and I grumbled about it, but in 2015, uh, my friend Foot Stewart and I, was we were way up in North Missouri, was doing a midday hunt. Foot was going to video, and I was going to hunt, because Foot had got his buck the day before. Well, get up to the tree, you know, we had a, uh, what we call a hanging stand. It's a fixed position stand where you use the climbing sticks. And I had the lifeline connected to it, so when I walk up to the tree, I, you know, I just, I mean, and it's so simple. You go, boop, and you're hooked in. There's no way you can fall from that point on. Well, I go up, I get, my stand was situated about 22, 23 feet. Well, I, I step over into my stand, and I grab a limb up here to pull myself in. Well, this limb was rotten, and I didn't realize it, and then it broke, and I fell straight back with my leg staying in the stand and it, it popped my hamstring. I mean, it sounded like a, sounded like a rifle going off. I thought I, I thought I had a compound fracture. And uh, of course, there's, you can find a little humor in everything. Poor old Put, he was, he was squalling. He was on the ground, oh my God. You know, I was like, Put, calm down, I'm not dead. So anyhow, I finally got myself situated to where I could get up in the stand and Put had to go get help. It was about a three to four hour rescue effort. And uh, at the end of it, you know, I got on to put, I said a good cameraman would have got all that on film, you know, but so I did make him, uh, I did make him film the rescue, uh, the rescue effort, but, uh, but that, that lifeline right there, I'm telling y'all, the, uh, the hunter safety system vest that Garrett has along with that lifeline is the cheapest life insurance policy you will ever buy. And I urge everybody, if you leave the ground to go hunting, get one because it's safe. Because there's no way, I'm, I'm a big old boy, there is no way I could have fallen 22 feet flat on my back and survived that. 
that lifeline right there saved my life. So I'm, I'm a first-hand, I got first-hand experience at it. They work. If they can hold my butt, they can hold anybody out there. Didn't give an inch, but, uh, but anyhow, I'm going to uh, talk about these turkey calls a little bit. This old call here, they got friction calls and they have air calls. Right? This, is, this is considered a friction call. This is as old school as you can get. That's just an old chunk of slate rock. That my daddy, my daddy carved a cedar limb, carved this striker out of a cedar limb. My daddy made this for me in 1983, and I still use it today. And it's a very effective call. I'll make a few little calls with it. You can call that one of the original turkey callers. I, I mean, I can imagine, like way back in the, 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 the way back in the frontier days, that's probably what they used. That and an air, uh, air operated call called a wing bone. But anyhow, that is, that's the old call there. And then you move up here, I realized, I was like, I've got, a, I've got an old Birmingham, a ML Lynch, Birmingham Jet Slate. This is, this is probably the, uh, the pioneer call of modern calls today. It's, uh, uh, it's just a simple little wooden box with a little striker on it. And it, it's real, real soft. Just sounds just like a real turkey. And it, 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 it sounds like this. That sounds just like a real wild turkey. Uh, you know, you watch these videos and stuff, and I'm, 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 the, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody. Da, 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 do all that loud calling stuff. That's not real life. This is real life here. Just listen. Woo. Heck, I'm about to gobble over that one. I better put that one up. And then, this call is known as a trough call, which these calls evolved to this. Uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Raymond Chisholm, Ch Chisholm from Laurel, Mississippi, was making these calls way back in the 70s. I remember my dad and his brothers hearing about these calls in 1974, 75, and they rode up there and they, got, they bought a big old bag full of them, and this is the only one I can find. But this is a corn cob. That corn cob is about 50 years old. That is the original corn cob. And he's got a piece of metal in here. And I'm telling you right now, this is like real. <laughs> that sounds like a turkey. That old man, was he was wise before his time because... It wasn't until just probably 15, 20 years ago you, you started seeing the big turkey call companies using metal for their calls. And this was at least from 74 or 75. But that's, that's what they call a trough call. All right, then you move on up. Everybody in this building, I guarantee you, knew Mr. Buddy Farkas. This is Mr. Buddy Farkas's call. It's known as a trough call now. We all know it as the Buddy call. And I was fortunate enough to, after Mr. Buddy passed on, his family gave me the honor of carrying on his call making stuff. So I'm, I'm making Mr. Buddy's calls now. And, and what I call it, you know, I got a little motto. I was like, everybody needs a hunting buddy. So this is the Buddy call. And these things are awesome. This is like, it's a friction call. That right there, that's, that's cutting of a hen. That's when they're real excited. This is a purr, a cluck and purr. That's a yelp, but that's Mr. Buddy Farkas. And you know, the calls just keep on evolving up. And then you get this. This is 
what is known as a pot call. It's just a round piece of wood with slate in it. And they have they have little layers of uh, of, of sound uh, enhancing material in there. And this call here, same routine as the others, but this one here is is a real good call because you can you can get real loud with it. Say like if you're out in Texas or Oklahoma or somewhere where it's wide open, and you'll see you'll notice from different from these calls to this one. makes my eyes blink that means it's working <laughs> that is a pot call then we move on up now this little call here is kind of hard to do they call it a scratch box this too is one of mr. buddy's old calls now when I'm in the woods there's not a better caller in the world. I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, Preston Pittman can't even call with me. Preston's a world-renowned turkey caller. When I got this little thing here, I get to sound so good, but I'm in front of a bunch of people, so it might not sound as good, but... <laughs> Mr. Buddy, you should look up at me and grin and say, that'd get him in there, there son. He, that's Mr. Buddy's old scratch box. But then we get on up here to a box call. This right here is a Lynch Deluxe full, a Lynch Deluxe foolproof. This uh, this call here give you a little bit of history on it. It's uh, it's called the you know the the normal Lynch is a foolproof. This is a Deluxe foolproof. Well, the owner of the company, Alan Jackson, every uh, not Alan Jackson. I'm thinking about country music. Alan Jenkins. <laughs> uh, he, uh, every year, his, his, uh, his company was up in Liberty, Mississippi. We used to stop by there. That was pretty cool when it was down in Liberty. We'd go in there and run all the calls and pick our own. Well, he would go through and pick the top 25 out of all the calls that that old man made. There was an old man he had there. I can't remember his name, but he, he made all the calls by hand. And the ones that, the top 25 that sounded the best, he put deluxe on it. And I'm fortunate enough to have one. I've had this one since 1992. I've sat on it. It's cracked. I got uh, wood glue on it, but it's still just. <laughs> look, look, I got one coming in. Look, there's a, look. Just proved that that call works. Hey, and it's a big old gobbler too, man. I missed him. Boom. <laughs> I think I got him that time. But anyhow, that's the deluxe foolproof. And then this is another Lynch box, which this one was made in Birmingham, Alabama, where the uh, this is where ML Lynch. Uh, originated from Birmingham, Alabama. Now this is a two-sided box. You can, you know, you can yelp with it. But what I like about this, all these other calls I've been imitating the hen. Well, this is the gobbler. It's a very, very handy call. Of course, don't don't use it, especially on public land, because. Somebody might think you're a turkey. Well, then you get into the air calls. I make these calls right here. Well, I'll start out with this one. I'm not very good at it. A friend of mine out of Mississippi made this, Andy Duvall. It's a, uh, some people call it a snuff can, a tube call, or whatever. It's just a little piece of uh, latex. Some people even make, uh, make them out of medicine bottles, but... You know, 
pretty neat little idea there. And, and, and see, I can, I can, I, I vision way back, you know, in the, like the 20s and the 30s and such, some old boy probably came up with that with a leaf or something instead of latex, but, but that's evolved into that. And then you, you get into to these here. I make these myself. It's called a diaphragm. They come in different configurations and cuts and reeds and stuff. This is a three reed. Please let this work in front of all these people. Probably the most popular call these days because you you hand for free and <laughs> nah, I ain't gonna do the purr. But anyhow, that's that. And then when you're turkey hunting, you got to locate them. This is considered a, a air call too. To locate them, you know, a, a gobbler. He, uh, he don't like any other kind of loud noise or anything. So a lot of times what we do when we're hunting, we'll imitate other animals. This is a crow. Pretty cool little call there. And then, now, now look, this is, a, uh, this is an owl hooter. I personally, I do it natural. But a lot of guys are using these, and I will attempt this. That's an owl hooter. And then, a lot of people use natural voice, and I'm one of those people, and it will be a miracle if I can get this out, but I'm going to try to do some, some natural voice calling for y'all. And then I got one more call, and then I'm going let to let the show go on. No calls. Now that, <clears throat> excuse me, this little thing right here, you know, being a call maker myself, you know, we, amongst all ourselves, we always swapping out calls. Well, I can't use one of these. I have several of them, old boys, a drive from all over the country. Man, you know, I want to get one of your calls. And, you know, here I am thinking, I'm finna make me a little money. And they said, look, I want you to have one of mine. Well, heck, I can't, I can't take his money. So we just swap out calls and, ah, ah. I can't do it, but I got a fellow in here that can, Mr. Dwayne Mitchell. Dwayne, come over here and show him how to use this trumpet. Well, Leon, he, he put it on me now. He told me last week, he said, look, he said, I want you to bring some of your wing bone calls to run. Well, I got up here, and naturally I forgot them. I said, Leon, got the call. Don't worry about it, I got some for you. Yeah, I knew he was going to do it, so I put these in the truck. And I'm I try to run this call, but y'all. This is called a trumpet. And, and what this originated from was the wing bone of a turkey. Yeah. They have wing bone calls, but the wing bone has kind of evolved into what they're calling a trumpet. And this is what they sound like.
And that's, that's an awesome call in there. Let me tell you, the guys that can work those calls will kill turkeys that guys like me can't. Because that is probably the most realistic call there is in the woods because, you know, sound just carries difference in, in the woods. And when you, when you hear somebody, I've been with Dwayne a few times with those, and I'm like, I'm usually, of course, running the camera. I don't ever get to shoot anything. I, all I can do is run the camera nowadays when I go with Dwayne and them, but I'm sitting there going, man, I just wish, I wish I could do that. But look, I'm telling you all right now. I can't do it. See, any of these old school Livingston Parish turkey hunters, I grew up with this wing bone. My daddy had wing bone. His brothers had wing bone. Everybody you seen walk around with a wing bone around in there. Billy Ray, I think you might have had one at one time. But anyway, that's the story. But anyhow, I appreciate y'all uh, listening to me, giving me your time. I'll be around here until it's over. If any of y'all, any of these youngsters, or anybody have any questions about calling turkeys or, or, or trying to hunt turkeys or, or deer or anything, I, I, I know how to hunt deer too. But I'll be here and just come up and ask me some questions. But I appreciate y'all. Well, Jeff, I'll get stuff here to the end. I want to mention this there about Mr. Leon as well. Mr. Leon does uh, a lot of work with youth and has done this for many, many years. Um, matter of fact, the first rack buck that I killed was actually at the Lazy S, a place that they had and still have portions of it in, in Gillsburg. And uh, I can remember, you know, just about every time I'd see him through the years, you know, he'd say, yeah, you killed your first buck with us. And I'd say, yes, sir, I sure did. And he actually told me a little while ago that, that he dug out that picture of, of me and that deer and uh, so I just wanted to thank you for what you did for me and all the youth that you've taken over the years as well. So, <clears throat> That kid had the whitest hair I've ever seen on anybody in my life. Well, you see that little girl behind you? That's yeah, about yeah, what it looked like. that's right. <laughs> so, all right, Caitlin, come on back up. Let's draw a few more prizes. All right, uh, Casey, I'm going to get you. Casey, y'all pass this stuff out. Uh, Brother Gene's going to be coming up and speaking in a moment. He's asked that uh, we pass out some of these yellow pieces of paper. They're going to put them face down in front of each person for now, and he'll give you more instructions about that later. I know you've been sitting there for a while. If you need to get up and go to the restroom, just bring me your gift, uh, bring me your tag, and you know I'll claim that prize while you're out of the room. And, oh, oh wait, leave it with somebody. But if you need to use the restroom right outside these doors on the left, you'll you'll find that. There's still plenty of desserts and drinks as well. Uh, make yourself welcome to those those items. So we have a few more gifts that we'll be giving out. Um, our first is another of the magnesium fire starters, and it goes to? Allie Basin. <laughs> All right. That'll be interesting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, next we have a $50 gift card to Southern Boys Outdoors, courtesy of JJ Dirt and Dozer. And it goes to? Kimberly. Seven. Fonts, Kimberly Fonts, right behind you there, Bronson. It's a the cardboard box. Yep. All right, put that back behind you. Next, we have a padded seat from Southern Boys Outdoors that goes to Tanya Miller. Blake's eyeballing that. Oh, he already got it. <laughs> Where's the little Debbie's? I know what he's thinking. <laughs> so, if you've ever hunt with Blake, we call him Snack House. <laughs> he brings a bunch of snacks in the woods with him. Next, we have a dozen burritos from the Hess Express. They go to? Jessica McMorris. 
Oh, yeah. <clears throat> we have another hat to Southern Boys Outdoors. It goes to... Raw Craig. Mr. Ron Craig, you in here? Hang on one second. May have said that one wrong. Uh, 225-892-3243. Craig, last name. Going once, going twice. Goes to Sorry. <laughs> Goes to me. All right, we're redrawing for that one. And it will go to... Bentley Chisholm. All right, Bentley, come get you a nice Southern Boys hat. Next, we have a back seat bow sling from Southern Boys Outdoors. It goes to Otto Goodwin. All right, for all of your real estate needs, see Mr. Otto Goodwin. We have another $50 gift card to Southern Boys Outdoors, courtesy of J.J. Dirt and Dozer, that goes to? Cameron Woods. All right, Cameron. <clears throat> Couple more items. Um, we have a $25 Academy gift card that goes to? Brett Morris. All right, Brett. We have a 4x4 off-road decal, courtesy of Southern Boys Outdoors. It goes to? Tiffany St. Germain. All right, Miss Tiffany. We're down to four remaining items, three of which I'm going to wait to give away at the very end. But before I turn it over to... Uh, Pastor Gene Hoyt, we're going to be giving away a custom-made turkey call made today by Mr. Leon Stilley that he has authenticated by signing on the back. It reads, Old Zine Hill, the blessing of the hunt, made by Big L, Leon Stilley, 9-11-22. And the winner of this call is? Angie Goodwin. All right, Angie. There you go. Now you want to run it for us? No. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I think we have all of what you needed out. All right, at this time I want to introduce to you Pastor Gene Hoyt. He is the pastor at Lighthouse Baptist Church a few miles up the road. Uh, I've known Mr. Gene for uh, most of my life. He has children and grandchildren that are in our community as well. Miss Karen is his wife, a uh, longtime basketball coach, state champion winning coach at Albany High School as well. Brother Gene is also an uh, acclimated uh, or acclaimed uh, world champion. Did I get that right? Turkey calling uh, world champion. So what year was that? 1993. So at this time, ladies and gentlemen, Brother Gene Hoyt. Appreciate it. I just don't want to drop any of them. <laughs> I used to do all that stuff that you've seen Leon up here doing. But I figured it was easier just to preach. Some really good calls. Quite a few. Anyway, it's, it's a blessing to be here tonight. I appreciate the invitation. Um, it's always, uh, it's always a, an honor and a privilege when you get to share with folks. And um, 
I've been knowing a lot of you folks for a long time. Maybe some of you I'm not familiar with, but I see a lot of faces that I am familiar with. Um, for quite a few years uh, of my life, I was a, uh, a competitive turkey caller. Uh, I like turkey hunting. I like the outdoors like most of you folks do. And um, I got into this competition turkey calling, and uh, to be honest with you, I became obsessed. If you look that word up, obsessed, you might be shocked as to what that word would mean to you or what the meaning actually is. And if I were to take a survey tonight and ask you, do you love deer hunting? Probably everybody in here, most of us, would raise our hand. If I were to ask you, do you love turkey hunting? A lot of you folks would raise your hand. Do you love baseball? Do you love softball and basketball and football and sports? Do you love rodeo? Rodeo's big in our area, especially for youth. I'm going to ask you a question now, and I don't want you to answer it. I just want you to think about it. What do you love the most? Have you been reading the newspaper any? Have you watched the news lately? Have you read your Bible lately? Do you understand and know what's going on in our world? Do you know the reasons that we have fallen so far in this nation so fast? I hope I can shed some light tonight on that for you and help you to understand. We've all been guilty of many things. I shared this morning with my church about what it takes and what it looks like to be watchful, the way the Scripture commands us to be, to be watchful for what? For Christ's return. You know Jesus is coming back? He says it in His Word. And the problem, or one of the problems in this nation is, is that we don't live like Jesus is coming back. We put everything else that we can find to fit into our lives first other than Christ, other than the living God that we all claim, or many of us do. Tonight, if you don't know Christ, I'd like to ask you to do this. Consider Him. I didn't go to a cross and suffer and die for you. I'm still here. Jesus went to Calvary's cross. He suffered and died for the sins of mankind. That means everybody in this room. Everybody. And the scripture declares there's none without sin. No, not one. We're all included in that. Every one of us. You're looking at a fellow who got in my mind that I wanted to accomplish something. I wanted to do something. I wanted to leave a legacy. I wanted to be a person that when I was gone, somebody would remember for any particular reason. And at that time in my life, I didn't realize it didn't really matter what the reason was. But I latched on to this thing called turkey calling and turkey hunting. And, and sports outdoors in general, it didn't really matter. Just like Leon and Dwayne and Many of you others, my daddy raised me on the banks of the Tickfall River. That's where, I, that's where I was raised, literally. In a, in a flat boat, running trot lines, uh, uh, squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting, turkey hunting, deer hunting, whatever. And I thought, you know what? Man, that would be a great way to make a living. That would be a great way... Uh, uh, to earn a living as a person that, you know, but how can you do that? What would it take for a person to be able to do that? Well, back in, the, back, in the, back in the 70s and 80s, this competitive turkey calling thing got real big, real big, and, and even on into the 90s. And today it's still a pretty, pretty big sport. And, and, and i seen guys who were just like me who had built themselves a turkey calling resume 
And, and what would happen is, is they, would, they would build that resume, they would accomplish all these, all these uh, uh, things and win all these awards and accolades, and they would send resumes to these outdoor companies, and those guys would get hired by these companies. They'd get paid salaries to do what they love to do every day. I said, man, that would be, that would be awesome. That would be great if I, if I could do that. So I, I made myself a goal. And I said, you know, the first thing I need to do is I, I, I need to become a, a champion caller. So I started practicing and working at it really hard. And one day in 1989, I'll never forget it. As a matter of fact, I still have the trophy. It's in collecting dust in a, in, in a box somewhere in my attic, but I still have it. And it was always one of my favorite trophies because, it, it, and it was just a third place trophy, but it was my first one. And I called in this competition amongst some good callers. And I took third place that day. And something ignited in me. Something got on the inside of me and, and, and it drove me. Talking about obsession. It, it drove me to, to get better and go farther and go higher. And that day I took third place and like Leon said, I, I thought I was somebody. Here I was calling in a turkey calling contest where Preston Pittman, the living legend, was, was the MC, and, and these guys all around me had much more experience than I did, but, but I took third place, and I, I, I was proud of that. And I went on, and that day after the contest was over, I, I got to speak with Preston. And I said, do you, do you think that I could ever do this professionally? And he looked right at me, and he said, no. And I, it just kind of disappointed me. I didn't understand. Man, I just won third place. Was you not in there? He said, no, listen to me before you get aggravated. He said, most men get discouraged before they have success. I said, well, you don't know this old boy. I want it. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make a deal with you. When you win your first major contest... That was in 1989. When you win your first major competition, I'll sign you as a pro staffer. I said, okay, that's a deal. In 1990, one year later, I won a national championship in turkey calling. Obsession. Desire. But you know, misguided, that can be the worst thing in the world. And believe me, mine was misguided. I went on, and I became a national champion turkey caller two times. There's another contest that only national champions can call in. Only national champions. That's a pretty elite group of guys. I became the national king of champions two times. and I became a world champion. And I was the champion in four states 11 times over. And I thought, man, to steal words from Ronnie Cush Strickland, the day I won the world championship, he said, you, my friend, have arrived. Man, was I puffed up. Be careful what you wish for, what you desire. Be careful what you give all your time and attention to. Be careful what you put your money into because it can leave you empty. Because according to the Word of God, it is fleeting. It is passing away. And it will not stand the test of time. It will burn. The only thing that is forever is Jesus and a relationship with Him. I spent money. I strained my relationship with my wife. 
I strained my relationship with my two children. I lost precious time with them. One Sunday morning, I'll never forget, just like this Sunday morning, my wife was a believer. My children were believers. And she would always send them into the bedroom after I'd get home from a long week of calling or weekend and ask me to come to church with them. And I never would go. And this particular Sunday morning, when all the resumes had been sent out and all the championships had been won, the phone was silent. You know why? Because God had other plans. And God's plans at that time in my life were not my plans. Be careful what you sow into because it can leave you empty. I wanted to share a few scriptures with you today and have a short message. I know many may not have a Bible here tonight. I know a few do because I've seen them. But I wanted to talk to you tonight about this thing called idol worship. Idol worship. The reason the country is in the shape it's in is because, to be quite honest with you, we've forgotten about God. We're chasing other things. I had a preacher tell me one time, show me a man's checkbook and I'll show you his heart. What does that mean? That means this. If you're giving more, if you're giving money to anything other than God, more than to God, that's your heart. When that preacher told me that, I ran home and I told Miss Karen, I said, I got to see the checkbook. I want to know that I'm giving to God more than I'm giving to anything else in my life. Are we? Are you? What do you love? First John says this in chapter 2. Oh my goodness. Listen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What do you love? What's got first place in your life? Hear me. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not the Father, but is of the world. Listen at 17. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. One last one. John said this as a warning. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. What does your checkbook say? What does your Sunday morning say? You see, somewhere today there was a guy standing on the platform of a, of a $15,000 or $20,000 or probably thirty or forty. dollars now. He was standing on the platform of a bass boat casting lures somewhere while some man somewhere was preaching the gospel. October's coming. There's going to be a bunch of men, 10, 20 foot high, just like Leon said, attached to a rope. 10, 20 foot high, 30 foot high. While some man's preaching the gospel. 
turkey season will come around in the spring. Local churches need the support of men. We need women, but we need men. We need men to be what they claim they are. That's men of God. Look, I understand these hunting trips that you pay for. I understand that. I understand why you, you pay good money, you go off on these trips. There may be a day here or there, but I'm talking about a man that will habitually abuse the house of God, the local church, his pastor, his family, and forsake all of that to go do something. That's his God. Show me a man's checkbook. Show me where a man spends his time on the Lord's day. And I'll show you his God. You know how I can tell you that? Not just because the word of God says it, because this guy did it. And I'll never forget, the night I said yes to Jesus was my last time Because I had resisted the Spirit of God and rejected the Spirit of God so much that I could do it any time I wanted to. If I didn't like what the preacher preached, I could, just, I could just harden my heart and walk away. And I thank God for men that preach the gospel. I thank God for men that tell the truth. And I won't ever forget the, ter- the sermon title. Bethlehem Baptist Church 1996, Bruce Gill. Sending away your day of grace. Don't send away your day of grace chasing something that's going to leave you empty anyway. Because that's exactly what it's going to do. You put your hope and faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and nowhere else. Because anything else and anyone else is going to leave you empty. Listen to me, I'm telling you the truth. Empty. Hunting. Sports, that was my idol. That was what I put before God. I didn't even know God. But there was a time in my life, even after I knew God, that I pursued these things uh, above Him, before Him. That's a dangerous place to be in. The book of 1 John was written by the Apostle John at around A.D. 90 and has so much to say that I'd like to share with you about idols. You see, America is is an idolatrous nation. That's what's wrong with us. That's why we've fallen so far. The power, the greed, the money, sports. Some of y'all are fixing to get mad. You're fixing to get mad, but you know what? I'd rather follow, follow Jesus down a lonely road and let you leave here and not hear the truth. This is the truth. The greatest enemy to the church today is undisciplined men and youth sports. Hear me. I can take you to a ball field next Sunday and it'll be full. It'll be full. I can take you to a gym, and it'll be full. I can take you to a hunting camp, and it'll be full of men getting ready to prepare and get food plots ready and get their stand and shooting lanes cleared out, all those things. I can take you to Lake Marpaul. I can take you to Tick Fall River, all those places. It'll be full of people. They'll ride right by here with that big rig while the man of God's preaching the gospel. What do you love? First John 1, verse 5 through 8, John warns against immorality. He warns against sin. You know the best thing about 1 John? is 1 John 1, 9. 
If we would but confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, from all sins that we've ever committed. That's the kind of God He is. I know lots of folks who've bought into the lie of the enemy and on Sunday morning they'll have their children somewhere not in the house of God chasing a little ball around. There's nothing wrong with that. I like sports. There's there's nothing bad about sports until you replace God with it. It's not just sports. It's not just ball. It's golf. It's work. It's your portfolio. It's whatever you, whatever you replace God with. It's, it's whatever comes first in your life. It's done easily. It starts off real subtle. And it looks innocent. But the scripture says this. Don't marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. What does that mean? It means it looks good, it's innocent, there's no harm done in it that I can see, but it pulls my children and it pulls my husband and it pulls my family away from God. Whether you believe this or not, This nation was founded on the Word of God. This nation was founded on the principles and precepts of God. And you see, the condition that we're in today is because we have run, we have fallen, we have bought the lie of the enemy and and, and taken innocent things into our lives and turned them into bad things. All those things I'm talking about are good things. They all are innocent things. But we make them gods. We turn them into gods. We turn them into the most important things in our life. We don't talk... Do you talk about God as much as you talk about that? Well, you don't realize, Gene, my son is going to be the next, I don't know, Nolan Ryan. You don't understand. We have, to, we have to go here and spend this time so he can advance his game or she can advance her game and at the cost of their soul. Why do you think the divorce rate in America is 54%? Because we've abandoned God. Well, preacher, we don't have to go to church to be saved. No, you don't. But there's somebody here that needs you on Sunday. God don't need you. But this man of God preaching the Word of God, he needs your support. Your family needs your support. Your children need your support. And they need your leadership. And they need to be here on Sunday. It's kind of hard to console a man when he just lost his job and, and, and be a friend in Christ to him. It's hard to do that when he's at church trying to serve God, his life's falling apart, and you're on a deer stand or, or fishing. I know this is hard stuff. I know it is, but America needs to hear this stuff. John describes the evidences of a true believer. A true believer is one who puts his love in action, not just words and deeds. I got a lot of friends who claim the name of Jesus. And I'll tell you where you can find them on Sunday morning. It's not sitting on a padded pew, I promise you that. The Bible says this in John 15, 13. It says, No man, greater love hath no man than this, 
that a man lay down his life for his friend. You can't lay your life down for your friend if you're not here with your friend. We put everything before God. Everything in America before God. You know what? You know who can change these ball leagues? You know who can change all this stuff that we chasing on Sunday instead of being in God's house? We can. You know how you do it? Just put your feet in the floor and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You do what you want to with your ball. We're going to serve God. And if enough people do that, pretty soon the leagues will change. Here's the problem, folks. 85% of Americans claim to be Christians. That's the biggest lie that the devil has ever told. 85% of Americans might speak the name of Jesus and say they know that name, but they don't know him personally. It's not hard to say I know Jesus. Not hard at all. I just want to share a few words with you and then I'm going to close. There's several reasons why that we need to be who we say we are. There's several reasons why that on a Sunday, on the Lord's Day, we need to make it the Lord's Day. We need to quit forsaking God, chasing something else, and make it what it is. It belongs to God. He has ordained it. And how in the world do we think we have the right to make it something else? First of all, that we may not sin against God. Well, it's a sin for me not to go. No, man. It's a sin for you to build something up in your life to make it a God in your life. To forsake God for it. That you might not sin against God. No man can serve two masters. Hear me now. No man, Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, or either he will, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I can't tell you the people I encounter who they just, they'll say this about their children. I, I don't know what happened. Everything was going so good. He was playing little league baseball and, and all of a sudden he's a teenager now and you know he got married and now it's just his whole world's falling apart. I can tell you what happened. No Jesus. No glue. No salvation. No blood. That's what happened. While you thought you were doing something good, trying to help him build himself up, what happens when sports leaves him? What happens when sports let him down? He turns to drugs. He turns to alcohol. He turns to adultery. He turns to those things that make him feel good for the moment. I live that. I had a son whose sports was everything, and if he was here tonight, he would say, tell it, Daddy, tell it. But when football left him, when there was no more games to play, he turned to drugs. He turned to alcohol. He turned to adultery. And you know why? Because he had a daddy that he never seen Jesus in. That's on me. Don't let that be your story. Get your kids to the local church. Forsake all that other stuff. Because it's going to burn. It's going to leave them empty. That you might not sin against God. That's the first reason. 
That's the first reason you need to come to God's house. That's the first reason that you need to know Jesus. You see, He'll wash all those sins away. Secondly, that you might love the things of the, that you may not, that you may not love the things of the world more than the things of God. First John 2.17 For the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. It's temporary things that we are trying to replace an eternal God with. You understand that? Do you think that Jesus is going to ask me when I stand before Him, hey, how many championships did you win? No. That's not what He's going to ask. You know one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture? Matthew chapter 7. A multitude of people stood before Jesus bragging about what they'd done for Him. Bragging about all their great works. My fear is this, that a lot of people, that 85% who call themselves Christians today, they're going to hear these words. Depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. You who say you know me. You who speak my name. You speak my name at church. You speak my name when you're in the crowd of people that you know follow me. You speak my name when it's convenient. But I never knew you. Thirdly, that you might have a proper love for humanity, especially brothers and sisters in Christ. A proper love. John 15, 12, it says, This is my commandment that you love one another just as I, just as I have loved you. First John chapter 4, verse 21. And this commandment we have from Him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Fourthly, that you might demonstrate proper faith in Christ as the Son of God. What do you love? I'm just asking you. I don't want answers. Do you know there's never been a question asked that won't be answered? Do you understand that? You don't have to answer it verbally when I ask you a question, but I know this, that in your heart you know the answer. Do you know Jesus? Have you ever confessed Him? Maybe you do know Him, but tonight you know and understand in the depths of your heart that you're not walking in His ways. You're going through the motions. You see, there's three kinds of people in every congregation. I don't care where we sit, what church matters not, what denomination matters not. I'm not a denominational guy. I'm just a Baptist. That's just the way it fell. That ain't going to get me anywhere. It's not going to get you anywhere. But you have to answer that question. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those that diligently seek Him. What are you seeking? How do we receive that faith? Well, tonight is a good start. 
Because the scripture says this in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. What you're hearing is not Gene's opinion. It's not, it's not something that I wrote down somewhere. What you're hearing is from the word of God. It's not my rules. It's not my gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus. It's the words of a living God. I don't know any other way to put it. And as I close, I'll just share this with you and then I will close. Don't believe the lie. It's hard to do these things, especially when you've got friends and folks you know sitting in the audience, but you need to understand this word needs to be proclaimed. And the truth needs to be proclaimed. Not some man's watered-down version that's going to tickle somebody's ear and make it sound good so we can all leave here happy and come back next week. We need to know the truth. We need to hear the truth. People are walking around today, full, churches are full of people, and they're thinking they're saved and they're not saved, and some are saved and, and they don't, they, 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 they're saved and they know it, and some are saved and they're in wrong relationship. I started to say that every congregation and every church and every group of people, there's three kinds of people in that, in that group, and that's people who are really genuinely saved. They love God. They asked God to save them, and He did, and they followed Him. And there's folks sitting tonight just probably that can hear me speaking right now. You made some profession of faith or you said some prayer when you was a kid at VBS. Why? Because somebody said, here, take these two cookies, drink this glass of Kool-Aid, we're going to say this prayer, and you're good to go. Well, I'm sorry to tell you the gospel don't work that way. You don't say a prayer and go out and live like hell. You know the greatest proof of a person that's genuinely saved and on their way to glory? The proof is a changed life. When's the last time somebody walked up to you and said, I remember you. I remember you when you were a heathen. You're a different man now. You're a different woman now. You're not like you used to be. You know why? Because old things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. Anybody said that to you? And then there's some folks, just like in Jesus' day, they hear the truth, they know they're not saved, and they reject it anyway. I don't know how many of you folks go to church here. But I know one thing. Something's going on at this church. Something's going on. This is real simple what I'm fixing to do. It's not complicated at all. You are one of those three people that I just described. Everybody sitting in here. You're one of those three. I don't know how to say the truth any plainer than I said it tonight. Placed in front of you is a, is a yellow card. Don't, don't, don't touch it. Don't, don't even look at it. It should be face down. That card's got two or three purposes. One of them is this. One of them is so the membership of the, of the church here can have a record of your attendance. Have a record that you were here. Another one is, is I'm going to give a couple prizes away personally from me. The only way you're eligible for one of those prizes is if you fill that card out. But before we do that, 
I want to pray with you and for you. And listen to me. I love you. I love you with the love of Jesus. I care about what happens to you. I've seen people die without Jesus. It's sad, especially when you don't have to. So with every head bowed tonight, please, no one looking around, no one moving. Let's honor the Spirit of God by being totally quiet, totally reverent. This message that I just shared with you tonight, God laid on my heart about one month ago. As a matter of fact, when I was called to do this event, God said, say this. If you're here tonight and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never in your life made a profession of faith, in the quietness and stillness of your sincere heart, just say these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I've lived my whole life the way I wanted to. I've lived my whole life in sin. Tonight I've heard your word. Tonight I realize that I'm on my way to hell. And I don't want to go there. Would you save me? 1 John 1, 9 said he's faithful and just if you'll ask him. That means he's not a liar. He'll do what he says he'll do. And if you ask him, all you have to do is say, Jesus, I need you. Would you save me tonight? Say it in the quietness and stillness of your heart and you're as saved as sure as you're sitting here. Mean it with all your heart. I want you to understand that the prayer does not save you. It's not the words you say. It's the sincerity of your heart. Christian, hear me tonight. Child of God. If you're not walking in the ways of God, the God that saved you, the God that you claim, if you're not walking in his ways, in the quietness and stillness of your heart, it's as simple as this. Lord, I am your child. Would you restore me tonight in the name of Jesus? Amen. Look at me, please. There's a card laying in front of you. I want you to understand something and I want you to realize something. When Jesus performed miracles, there was always a witness. When Jesus called people to salvation, there was always a witness. If you prayed either one of those prayers tonight and meant it with all your heart, on that card is a place for you to mark that. There's a place for you to mark that I accepted Jesus tonight as my Savior. There's a place for you to mark that I recommitted my life tonight as a follower of Christ. Maybe you want to talk to somebody. There's a fine pastor at this church. Mark on there. There's a place that says, I'd like the pastor to call. But whatever you do, you make it known on that card tonight if you made a decision. Put your name, phone, net, phone number, and address on there. Fold that little card up. 
and pass it to the front of the table. And we'll take those cards and we'll put them in a container. We're going to draw out a couple names. Tonight I'm going to be giving away a turkey call and I'm going to be giving away a, a game camera. The winners will be drawn from those cards. I will be here for quite some time if you want to talk. There are several men of God here if you want to talk to someone. I want you to know tonight once again that I do love you. And I appreciate you allowing me to be here to share this gospel message with you. And if you ever need anything, I'm just a phone call away. Appreciate you. Thank you and love you. on that and pass that to the end of the table um, just know the things that you're marking on that are the most important things that will happen here tonight more important than any giveaways more important than a big Tom with inch and a half spurs or a 150 class buck right this is what it's all about right here right now so I'm going to give you a couple minutes to take care of this <clears throat> Okay, if you uh, will give us your attention just for a moment, we will uh, wrap things up. I think we've collected all of Brother Gene's yellow cards. A couple more go in the bucket right there. I see a couple in the back behind you. <clears throat> behind okay all right you can stay up here so this first Drawing is going to be
for the, uh, the game camera that Pastor Gene is going to donate. I'm going to mix them up and ask you to come draw for me. Come on over here. All right. Again, this is for the game camera. All right. And the winner is... Kippy Cooper. Cooper. Kippy Cooper. Uh, all right. Did you win the game camera earlier? All right, hold that one, and we're going to draw one more. And this will be for the turkey call that works well in the right hands. And I believe you've even signed this as well, acknowledging uh, this gift from this event tonight. The winner of this is Jeremy Cooper. Jeremy Cooper. All right. There we go. Put them back in there. All right. And now, thank you. You can have a seat. So we have three items remaining just uh, to kind of make sure we all understand what we have remaining. We have a 410. Uh, this is a crack barrel shotgun. It's not in the box. So if you win this prize, you'll need to see me. Uh, FBI wants you to fill out the paperwork, not one of us. So you'll have to take this box with your, the information that we collect from you tonight and go to uh, Archery and Fishing Unlimited in Hammond to collect the gun and fill out the paperwork. This prize is courtesy of JJ's Dirt and Dozer as well. So this is, uh, yes, thank you very much. After that, we will draw for a guided youth. Now, this just came in like the last 30 minutes of this, so I don't even know about this one yet. A guided youth turkey hunt. Now, when we say youth, you have to be 17 years or younger to win this one. So if we draw it for one of you old people, we're going to have to keep drawing until we get the right age group for this. So... This is courtesy of Mr. Dwayne Mitchell and his videographer, Mr. Leon Stilley. And we'll, yes, thank you. And will take place at Bear Creek Hunting Club. So thank you, Bear Creek Hunting Club members as well. And last, we have a two-day semi-guided hunt for two people. This is good for two does. This will take place in northeast Louisiana on a farm owned by Mr. David Robertson. He has donated this. So if you win this, you will see me, and this includes lodging. Um, you have an option if you'd like to purchase a buck tag that goes along with this as well, and they have some hammers on this place. So this is good. All right. So, uh, how about we do the, the kids only one first? So, all right, Caitlin, mix them up good. I put, I dumped everybody's name back in the bucket. You have to be 17 or younger to win this prize, the guided hunt. And... Heath Brunies, you don't make the age qualification, Heath, but I'm glad you're here tonight. All right, we're going to put you back in it for one of the other prizes. Keep drawing. This may take us a moment. How about Blake Brown? You in here, Blake? You're Blake? Come see me, Blake. All right, that is for you. And look, Blake, before you leave, is that dad with you back there? Y'all make sure you connect with Mr. Dwayne and Mr. Leon before y'all leave tonight. All right, good deal. Very good. All right, now we're going to draw for the shotgun. Mix them up. And... All right. All right. 
And the winner of the shotgun goes to Butch and Brandy Penton. <clears throat> who has twin boys that I'm sure will get to have some pleasure out of this. So, all right, good deal. <clears throat> and the last drawing of the night is our semi-guided hunt to Mr. Dave Robertson's farm. The winner of this, you will need to see me afterwards. And it goes to... Miss Morgan Crane. <laughs> All right, Morgan. Yeah, come on up here. <laughs> Have you ever killed a deer, Morgan? You're going to kill one on this trip. <laughs> All right. That's going to be awesome. That is great. <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to our associate pastor, Brother Blaine. He's going to mention a couple of upcoming events and close us out. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to everybody that's worked hard, all our sponsors. This has been really, really good. All right. I know, I know it's been a late night. Give me 30 seconds. So we have some events kind of scrolling. We have a lot of kids in here. Kids Night Out, uh, Saturday, October 1st. Great opportunity uh, to hang out with your kids and have a date night with your spouse. Sign up for that. Uh, student Ministry Retreat, we have that going on Uh in a couple weekends, sign up for that if you have a teenager. Women's conference coming up in November. Uh, tomorrow, we are, uh, Ozon Hill will be building a, um, a wheelchair ramp. And so if you are available tomorrow, please reach out to uh, Mr. Jimmy Alford uh, and let him know because we're trying to get that. Uniquely blessed is this week, uh, is tomorrow as well. A lot of cool things happen, a lot of uh, great events. So uh, we're excited. But make sure if you're a kid or a teenager, you get them signed up for these events coming up. Fall Fest in October is going to be awesome. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and this time. God, we thank you for the word that was shared. And Lord, I just pray your covering. Lord, as we leave, Lord, for safe travels, and that, God, we will be a light, Lord. We will be a light to, to, um, to the world, Lord, the, the broken world we're going to, Lord, that we will be your hands, your feet, Lord, um, that you will open doors for us to live out your truth, live out your gospel, uh, Lord, to those who are hopeless. And so, Lord, I just pray, I thank you for this time, and we just, Lord, give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.